breaking the wall of economic uncertainty. How online data can help us understand the economy. How Varian, Google Incorporated. I remember the sadness I felt when I visited East Berlin in 1980, and joy and relief I felt in 1989 as I watched the TV news and saw the wall being taken down. So last night we had a very nice reception and I noticed that a lot of wine was being consumed. So I thought this audience might be experts on the following question. What day of the week are there the most searches for hangover? <laughs> I guess that's Qatar and uh, German. How many people think Sunday? How many people think Monday? And how many people think Tuesday? Well, it's a very sober crowd, I think. <laughs> how would you find out the answer to this question? Well, of course, you would go to Google. And in this case, it's an application called Google Trends. It's open to the public. Anybody can use it. You can do this at home. And at Google Trends, I've typed in the term hangover, and I put in the date, and you can see a very regular pattern. It peaks every Sunday, and that big spike that you see is, in fact, January 1st. <laughs> now, if you scroll down the screen a bit, you can see the geographic distribution. <laughs> and in this case, you would notice that New York is the hangover capital of the United States. And finally, you can do comparisons. In the next chart, I show the searches for vodka and the searches for hangover, and you can see they're separated by exactly one day. <laughs> So let this be a lesson to us all. <laughs> One other example that's kind of fun is to look at searches for a term, a historical term, civil war in the US. And you can see that this has a, a very, very regular pattern. It repeats itself year after year. Why is that? Some people say holidays. Some people say uh, education. Well, anyone who's taught at a university knows that peak occurs three days before the term paper is due. And it repeats itself in a very regular uh, pattern. Now, both of those are fun examples, but let me give you a slightly more serious example about unemployment. So when economists measure unemployment, they look at two numbers. One number is the initial claims for unemployment, what happens when people first become unemployed. They go to the unemployment office and they file for benefits. And the other number that people look at is the unemployment rate, how many people are unemployed at a given point in time. And of course, these numbers vary significantly according to whether or not we're in a recession. So in this chart, the gray bars are the recession, the red lines are the unemployment rate, and the black line is the initial claims of people filing for unemployment benefits. Now you'll notice, if you look at that chart, that the initial claims peaks right at the end of every recession. It's the best single indicator for the end of a recession, and in fact, it tends to peak about six months or four months before the unemployment rate peaks. So people watch that number very closely. They're very interested in the behavior of that initial claims to unemployment. Now, you might ask yourself, if you became unemployed, what would you do well, perhaps one of the first things you do is you go to your computer, you say, where's the unemployment office? How do I file for unemployment? How much are unemployment benefits? How does the system work? And we have a tool at Google, which you can use, where you can enter any time series, any series uh, that you want, and find the queries that are the most correlated with that series. So in this particular case, I entered the initial claims for unemployment, the official numbers downloaded from the government, and uh, I came back with the answer that said the query that's the most correlated with that series is in fact the queries on unemployment office. Very natural under the circumstances. So the question you might ask is could you use those queries to try to predict the initial claims for unemployment in this particular uh, example? Well, as we all know, prediction is hard, especially about the future. 
So in fact, we'll lower the bar a little bit. We won't try to predict the distant future. What we'll do is what economists call now casting. We'll focus on trying to understand the current state of the economy. And that's still quite valuable because the official statistics are released with a lag. So if you have an idea of what the statistics will look like before they're released, it gives you a little leg up in terms of understanding the current state of the economy. And so you can apply some statistical methods. You look at the initial claims for unemployment this week, and you might specify that they depend on the initial claims for unemployment last week, plus this new variable, the queries, on the term unemployment office. And the way to do this uh, from a statistical point of view is estimate the model up until time t, forecast the next week out of sample, and repeat through all the observations that you have, compare a baseline model to the model with the queries, and when you do that, you find that you get about an 8.7% improvement in that out of sample mean absolute error. So typically, uh, if you do this for other sorts of statistics, you'll find something similar. You can find uh, improvement in the forecast accuracy, the very short-term forecast, the nowcast, of somewhere between 5 and 10%. So here's a little picture of what it looks like. That's the initial claims to uh, unemployment is the black line. The uh, red line is just a baseline, simple model. And the green line incorporates this additional variable from the uh, Google uh, searches. Another example is consumer sentiment. So this is a measure that's conducted by the University of Michigan. They call up several thousand people each month. And they say, uh, are you and your family better off than you were a year ago? Do you and your family expect to be better off next year than you are now? So it's these questions that they're using to gauge the confidence or the sentiment of the uh, individuals involved. And you might think that the kinds of queries that people are entering into search engines would in fact also reflect to some degree the consumer sentiment. Now before I use specific queries, but in this case I'm going to use categories of queries, I plug this data, the consumer sentiment, into a statistical system and the system finds those categories of queries that are the most predictive of consumer sentiment. So we start with a trend, which is just the rough time series of fitting a uh, line. The red line is the trend. The blue uh, dots are the consumer sentiment. And then the, the bars down below are the errors in terms of that uh, fit. And now we start adding these query categories. These are queries on financial planning, and you can see now the red line is approaching the blue dots a little bit better. The errors have gone down a bit. We add in queries on investing, and now the line is really zoomed in on those dots. The errors are getting smaller. We add business news queries. When the recession hit, people were very anxious during the financial crisis. A lot of queries on business news, and add in search engines. The same idea, we get even closer, and now the errors have become almost uh, uniform. We're fitting just about as well during the recession as during the other periods. And finally, we add in energy and utilities, and now we see we have really a pretty good fit to the, over the entire range. Now, of course, this is just prediction. I'm not asserting causality or anything like that. We're just trying to see, can we use this real-time data the data that's available on more or less a continuous basis to help improve our estimates of what the official data will look like when it's released in a month or two. Now, this has stimulated a lot of economic research. The central banks are particularly interested in now casting the economy because it's their responsibility to try to respond to changes in economic conditions. So there have been research reports from the Bank of England, the Bank of Chile, Israel, Spain, European Central Bank, all of these places who are trying to utilize the data to understand employment, unemployment, inflation, retail sales, auto sales, travel destinations, and so on. So there are many possible ways you can mine this data to understand uh, social phenomena. And let me also emphasize that this is not just Google that has this data, but in fact, there are many private sector companies that have real-time data. For example, if you look at 
Credit card companies, they can tell you how much was charged on their credit card yesterday. And you look at shipping companies like UPS and FedEx, they can tell you how many packages were sent uh, on a given day from a given region. If you look at large retailers like Walmart, Target, and so on, you can find out exactly how much consumers spent in those chains on a day-by-day, -day, and in some cases, even hour-by-hour -hour basis. Now, if you compare that private sector data, where companies have spent the last decade building real-time data systems to measure the performance of their organization on a daily or hourly basis, it's much, much higher frequency data than you see from the government agencies. The government agencies have historical data. It's very carefully corrected. It's very labor intensive. And in fact, it tends to be rather low frequency, monthly data or quarterly data. So being able to combine that real-time data that comes from the private sector with the official statistics from the public sector should give us a way to understand the functioning of the economy better than we are now. So, thank you very much.